So our next speakers are two colleagues of mine uh, from here in the library, Robert Nelson and Tony Sams. Robert and Tony run our audio and vi video studios respectively and are here today to talk about digital storytelling. Storytelling in these digital times has become sophisticated in its methodologies, but relies on a form of communication that has been a powerful tool to make arguments, to inspire, and to record our history for thousands of years. Tony and Robert are experts in this field and will be giving examples of the past projects as well as discussing storytelling's place in modern pedagogy. Let's welcome Robert and Tony. Thank you for coming out and, and uh, hearing us talk about how Tony and I have been creatively engaging digital storytelling into audio and visual literacy. So why storytelling? If you can see here, it's the oldest form of teaching. It bonds our communities together. It's how children learn from their elders on the big issues of life, creation, life, and afterlife. They define, shape, and control us and make us. Not every human culture in the world is literate, but every culture tells stories. If you can see there, there's the Epic of Gilgamesh, right? Several thousand years old, before the first Sumerian scribe tapped on the clay, that story made its way through the Sumerian culture in southern Iraq. So what can storytelling do in the classroom to enhance learning outcomes? Tony and I each have an example that we've worked with a class, and we're going to show you how that has worked for us. So let's give you a little background to Tony and myself. In the late 2000s, this library went through a massive renovation, and what they did was created an audio studio and a video studio in the faculty center right across from the cafe. Many of you have used our services. Many of you understand that this is part of new media integration in um, traditional academic librarianship. So this department at the time was called the Digital Scholarship Lab, and I was an education librarian at the time, and then um, I was pulled in and, done and put, put into the audio studio to manage its services because of my background on radio station KRCL, 90.9 FM here in town. Tony was the same. And he was, uh, um, you worked in the um, library computing, but he has a deep background in filmmaking and, and uh, photography, and so he was pulled off of that assignment and made the video studio um, project specialist. So in 2015, we went through a library reorganization, and now we're part of what we're hoping to call the New Media Lab in the Creativity and Innovation Services Department. So that includes fine arts, architecture, maker spaces, 3D printing, GIS. We hope to grow from there into things like gaming, animation, and those sorts of things. And so the projects that we're gonna talk about, Tony's gonna talk about writing 3040, voicing folklore, discovering special collections through digital storytelling. And I'm gonna talk about my work in COM 5580, which is a public public relations and nonprofit campaigns. And the campaign that we used was my radio program on KRCL, Smile Jamaica. So let me introduce Tony. He's my colleague, and his title is New Media Project Specialist. And so take it away, Tony. OK, so I'll try to just be brief about my story real quick and how I came into sort of this storytelling mode. And um, it involves kind of some silliness. I grew up in rural Ohio and I had a family of storytellers and my grandpa was sort of like the um, patriarchal storyteller of the family. And once upon a time I used to race downhill mountain bikes and uh, had a little crash, bumped my noggin, broke some bones in my hand and while I was having surgery, or after the recovery process, sorry, um, I had a morphine-induced vision <laughs> my grandpa. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he sort of, um, he challenged me in this vision to um, pass on this tradition. And I woke up, my wife was sitting there, and I told her I was going to build a mobile application to tell digital stories. And she just sort of laughed, and I passed out. And then nine months later, uh, my little digital <coughs> storytelling app um, was uh, available 
in the App Store. And it's now used by like 300,000 teachers around the world. It's kind of petering out because I haven't <laughs> been keeping up with it because uh, I'm not the greatest business person in the world. But it's been, it's been such a, a great ride. From that moment on, that was in 2009, um, I really just embraced storytelling in so many different things. And I had the opportunity to come downstairs to work in the digital scholarship lab. And, um, you know, we just went from there. So, uh, obviously the setting here is a, we're, we're a big research one library um, or institution. And the library has um, a fantastic video studio. And we have a teaching classroom close by, which is just right outside, that the audio studio also shares. And of course, our special collections department is housed really close by, upstairs on the fourth floor. Um, what I was trying to do when we first started this class, I actually wanted to teach a workshop. So I approached my previous supervisor and asked her if I could teach a writing workshop on digital storytelling. And she said, let's teach a class. So she proposed it, and she got the class rolling. It was a writing 3040 class. And the idea behind it was to um, engage learners um, by providing visual literacy, um, information literacy, obviously, because we're in the library, um, building story construction through storyboarding um, and then storytelling, and then to um, eventually, what this kind of came about was to access our special collections department, which is sort of this hidden jewel upstairs that's normally reserved for scholars and researchers. Um, it was a basic introductory course. Uh, 3,000 level, it was a writing minor, and the, it really came about from a grant-funded project that I, I wrote a grant for a writing uh, course, um, or, or sorry, to, to teach workshops in the library, and I went to a, a digital, stel digital storytelling course down in um, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and learned from a fantastic Emmy award-winning um, visual storyteller, his name was Bob Sasha. In our first semester of the course, it was you know, I came about from this like visual background of photography and I wanted to teach, you know, how to look at photographs and how to analyze them and how to use them with, you know, within stories. And many of the people, many of our students are, uh, it, was, it was really boring. I was hoping Allison would jump in and talk about writing, uh, but we soon found out that it, you know, we needed to be, it needed to be more learner centered and not so much institutional centered. It was our first time, it was very slow. But we did visit special collections, and that's when this sort of seed was planted that we have this ability to um, introduce visual storytelling in the library, but also to incorporate um, our special collections department. The last time that I taught the course, um, Allison was no longer here, and it was, well, she was, sorry, but she was no longer teaching, and it was just me. And it really was about practice. Just dive in, and we'll learn the content afterwards. Um, it felt more natural with the students. You know, once we visited special collections, we just talked and, and we sort of let them tease out what it is that they wanted to talk about in their digital stories. Um, it felt very learner-centered. Um, there was a lot of empathy, so students working together and understanding their needs. Um, and to, you know, and we, I guess we worked together to help people with different learning modalities. So there were, you know, people who were great writers and people who were really technical, and that, that worked out to be, um, you know, a, a really good uh, creative environment. I have some links I thought I would show you. Um, I guess I probably should talk about what we did. Um, we visited special collections. <coughs> the staff members in special collections brought out a lot of artifacts. The students were able to engage with them, come back and talk, and then go back to special collections via email, you know, to talk with our um, archivist. Um, or in person to see, you know, what we have, and they brought out artifacts for them to use for their digital stories. Um, the first assignment that we did um, addressed um, folklore and urban legend. We created our stories. Um, we also used blogging and social media, so the students would create Tumblr accounts. Everything was put up there. All their reflective writing on their videos was online, uh, and they were they were instructed to share all of their um, videos online with their families through Facebook and with their friends. And they got great feedback, and th the students shared that in class, you know, the comments from their um, friends and family on Facebook, which was awesome to include social media. 
N. We read um, Sherwood Anderson's Winesburg, Ohio text because um, it's a fantastic uh, book about storytelling. And the students had to write reflectively. It was sort of a self-paced throughout the semester. What is the magic button? I'll show you a quick video uh, that one of the students created. Is there a thing for the, I was just 15 the when I saw Robert audio? For the first time. My family and I lived on a soybean farm six miles down Highway 278 from downtown Clarksdale. In the 1930s, there's a lot of nothing in those six miles. Late July in the Mississippi Delta is hot beyond explaining. It's a wet, sticky heat like standing in front of an open oven with wet clothes. The one thing I looked forward to after long weeks in the field was making it to Abe's to hear the best pickers within 100 miles. I knew this particular Friday was going to be a good one. Sheriff Darby and his good-looking daughter picked me up on the long walk into town. I luckily had time to wash up before scurrying out the door. I had them drop me off at the market, so her father didn't know I was going to a juke joint. More people were waiting outside of the bar than normal. I always showed up early, hoping to catch a glimpse of the band setting up and tuning their guitars. Eddie Benson, a friend from class, had an uncle that cooked there, and would sneak me in the back door if I promised to sit quietly. Robert came in casually, a little bit later than expected. The house band started setting a groove while Robert seemed to compose himself. It was as hot in the bar as it was in the field. The windows were dripping with condensation. And with so many people crammed in, the smell was almost too much to bear. He slowly raised his guitar. Okay. And the link to that will be up, I guess, when the presentation is up online. I don't want to show you the whole thing. It's pretty long. Um, so we, it was, it was about flexibility in the class. So as we went through and visited special collections, this student in particular was um, intrigued by certain artifacts, but then didn't work out with the story that he wanted to tell, but it inspired him to tell this story about the crossroads. And so he used artwork and from online and manipulated it within Photoshop and various other applications, um, created a story within Adobe Premiere. But what was unique about it is that he, ha he had, um, you know, sort of this freedom instead of having, you know, you have to do this, that he created like this little like he was interviewing his father, and it was a telephone conversation. That's why it sort of sounds tinny. And um, another one of my, our students, um, who was a community student in continuing education, was a Vietnam veteran and had had, you know, he brought his experience to the class and working with other students and was able to talk about his experiences in life and then continue on to tell a story that he really wanted to, um, to talk about. And it, this gave him a platform. Lieutenant Cowley called home from a war zone under the impression he was to be promoted, found he was being investigated for murdering over 500 Vietnamese civilians at My Life 4. He obtained the services of George Latimer, an experienced criminal lawyer in both civilian and military court systems. While Latimer's first impression was the charges would not be filed, external events and pressures resulted in Lieutenant Calley being charged and convicted for murder of 109 Vietnamese civilians. All officers of higher rank were protected from prosecution by those in charge. An infantryman has one goal in a war zone, come home alive and whole. He obeys orders. That's how he has been trained. The ever-present danger, boredom, Sleep deprivation. So a lot of the artifacts within housed within special collections sort of sparked this story, and he was able to go outside through the Library of Congress and contacted many of his friends who were veterans to help piece this story together. It took him a while, um, but you know, once again, we just sort of dove into the technology. We didn't spend a lot of time talking about how you can use Adobe Premiere. We just jumped in and used it, and so. It was great to have him in the class, this experience. So the assignments um, 
We had a few outside of the, just the special collections, but they focused on folklore, urban legend, and then self-narrative. And once again, Sherwood Anderson, um, Winesburg, Ohio text was used, and creating short stories in media form and then shared socially were these little sort of filler assignments that we had in between, so they would get responses back from friends and family, and then they could add on stories through Facebook and um, various other, like Instagram. Staying, you know, staying flexible was the key the last semester. Um, lessons learned uh, that teaching in, in this environment really needed to be about building a community. It, it needed to be learner-centered. Learner um, exposure, exposure to special collections and services is invaluable because it is an amazing resource. If you were to shake away everything in this building and all the services we offered, special collections is really it's the diamond. It's what, it's what makes us unique. Um, narrative structure and including social media in the class was imperative. Once we, were, once we opened up to allow Facebook and Instagram and then use of Tumblr and the way that st the students in the class um, reflected upon each other's writing uh, is, was totally uh, different from the first time that we taught it. And of course, all this experience has helped me with planning a new course. Um, I'm working, about, uh, working on uh, writing a, a 1,000 level writing class uh, and, and using our instructional design group to help me understand like, what it was that I taught and then you know, what I, what I want to teach from a systems thinking. I don't have that background. So. And it's really about the people. So you know, spending time with our students and just having conversations and watching them react uh, and interact with each other uh, was, was key. So. Any questions now or should we wait after this? Yeah? Did you have any pushback um, with your last semester of teaching with um, a student who was just like, no, I need my information first before I jump in? That's right, yes. Yeah. So I, did, I had a couple students, but one in particular who's sort of a quiet student and you know, it, it, was, it was, I think, more difficult to sort of just leave him out there with all of this, you know, kind of room to, to roam, that he needed a little bit more structure. And so it was easy to, to see that, right? Because I'm that person. I, I need to have structure, because if not, then I sort of will drift out there as well. And so it was nice to be able to have, you know, uh, you know flexibility within the classroom to work with him and to look at his, the way that he needed to present his stories and what information he needed, so, yeah. yeah. So did you, was it more one-on-one -on -one work between you and him, or was it, you know, bringing the classroom community together and kind of sussing out what he, you know, how he wanted to work? Sure. So I sat down with him one-on-one, -on -one, you know, in the back of the classroom, and there, was, there were two other students that were really close to being in the same boat, but they sort of, we all worked together. And then in turn, it's hard for me not to say names, because <laughs> it's a personal, <laughs> but they helped, you know, they, they really, they worked together. Okay. And then of course the gentleman who was the, our, you know, community member, continuing education, right. Uh, he, when he could help, he was always willing to jump in yeah. and to point things out, you know, so. Yes. Um, so I'm curious about like the location of the class and if you know if we had any sessions about working with like technology, like a recorder, the computer pen corner, and stuff like that. Right. So being in charge of the video studio was really nice, and the classroom was just inside the faculty center, right next to the video studio. So we would literally be working together. I would run over, get a student set up so they could tell their story, and then go back into the classroom. And then when they were done, they would come back and another student would rotate in and out. And once again, the technology, we just jumped into it. You know, uh, we didn't really talk too much about cameras and aperture or iris and all the technology stuff, like three point lights. We didn't, we, we just, you know, I had it set up ready to go. And then it, and as well as the technology, um, all the computers in the little lab, you know, have all the video editing software that you could possibly want. But we used Adobe Premiere and we just jumped into it at first. What did you call um, the, the software for the, that, the reflective essays? Were they, was it one of the first websites that you showed? Tumblr. That's Tumblr. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. It was really simple. Two students use WordPress, but Tumblr seems to be, I don't know, it was probably, everybody has an opinion about it. But for me, it was really simple to set up. It didn't require a lot of activation of other, you know, add-ons. And it was pretty straightforward. So. Yeah, it reminded us of Omeka software, you know, that Oh, yeah, software. yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. But it, just, it seemed a little easier to use, perhaps, so. It's really simple to use, yeah. yeah right. right. Yeah. Um, how did you advertise for the class, and what majors were the students uh, in your course? Right, so once again, coming back to, like, just not really being a great business person, we didn't really advertise the class at all. Um, no flyers uh, anywhere. Just sort of word of mouth. Um, and most of the students, like our first semester, um, most of the students were English majors in their third and fourth year. And then the last semester, it really was, there was a lot of variation from engineering um, to fine arts and, and some, you know, comm majors. So yeah, it was, it's, you know, there's a lot of room. Yes? What is your app that you developed? Oh, Story Robe. Story, robe, like Native Americans told story, the stories on buffalo robes, story robe, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, took that. <laughs> I always feel guilty, but, you know, yeah. Yeah, I had, in, had um, I wrote a grant to bring a Native American elder here, and uh, he's the one that convinced me that I can use the word vision with the uh, morphine. <laughs> yeah, and we, we, had a, we had a great talk about, you know, uh, using Story Row as a name, he thought it was okay. So. Okay. Thanks, Story. So thank you, Tony. So let's pivot now to um, my digital storytelling inclusion, and I'll tell my story. So I'm from northern Montana, came here to the University of Utah in the mid-80s to study here. Got a job in the government documents department in 1988, and about a month later, my roommate and I were sitting in the pie, and they were doing a call for the local community radio station, KRCO, and they were looking for early morning programmers. So I was really interested in reggae music at the time. My roommate was more like 80s rock kind of stuff, and so they really didn't need that, but they were looking for someone to do early morning reggae, 3 a.m., 6 to 6 a.m., in the middle of the coldest winter they'd had in 30 years. So I would take my, my box of records from I lived in the medical towers and take them down to the station, which was on 2nd second, second West and 8th South at, at the time. And several times I had to call AAA to get me home, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. So I also have a bachelor's in history, graduated, pretty much got a job in the library, never left, pretty much got a show on KRCL, never left. So my, my story also is a little bit about what's been going on in this media revolution in the past 10 years. What have we seen happening with traditional media? So Blockbuster Video goes out of business, Tower Records go out of business, which was one of the saddest days of my life because that's how I always got my music, is go to California and hit record stores. All of those were flush back then. People were. People were getting rid of their vinyl to make room for these new fancy gadgets called CDs. So it was a great time to pick up a bunch of reggae music in the racks in Berkeley and San Francisco for, for real cheap. And now it's ironic that vinyl's making a comeback while CDs are pretty much on, on their way out. So, what, so what's going on with, with community radio is that they have also been hard hit in this media revolution. People are now able to um, be independent in how they consume music media, iTunes, Spotify, Pandora. So in the past 10 years, you've started to see some kind of the same wobbly nature that, that took Tower Records and Circuit City out of business is starting to impact community radio stations, which are non-commercial, so they can't sell advertising, and they usually get their fundraising through um, Radiothons, usually one in the fall, one in the spring. Well, those are starting not to be as effective as a way if you have fewer listeners and you have fewer people willing to pay $60 for a t-shirt. So in 2008, KRCL went through a format change that kind of they worked with the Corporation for Public Broadcasting to try and do something about this. 
And the same with, uh, there's a local NPR station in town that's also struggling, and they owe NPR over a million dollars. So it's tough, tough road to hoe for community radio stations. So my take on this is, how do I, as a um, reggae programmer on a Saturday afternoon show, how do I reach out if everybody's independent in their musical media selection? So how am I able to do that? Plus, there's the double whammy of the 2008 Great Recession, so a lot of people, even if they're listening, they can't really afford to give anymore. That's an opportunity as, as well as a, a detriment, and I'll tell you why. So what can I do to make my little reggae show worthwhile for you to put down your, you know, to turn off your iTunes or Spotify or whatever? Well, if I'm sitting in a coffee shop, you know, reading a Rolling Stone, I have my iTunes in, what's going what, to what's gonna make me want to tune into radio? And the, the human element is what's missing in all of those iTunes, Spotify, and Pandora's. So what can I do to integrate? What, what, what benefits do I have to try and integrate people to add that human element to their media consumption? I'm a reggae collector, so I play all my own music. I know a lot about this music. I'm a reggae historian through my seeking of history. I work in a library, which is all about organizing and collecting information. So right away, I've got all of the resources I need to become a digital storyteller. And that's what I have done to try and make people tune in on a Saturday afternoon when they could just do whatever they want on their, on their own media consumption. And the benefit of that also is that since 2008, you, all, you always hear that young people don't listen to radio anymore. That's really not true. If you just graduated from the university and you owe 50000 on your student loans and you're living in your parents' basement, one of the first things that's going to go is your Spotify and Pandora subscription. So what's happening is, is they're coming back to radio because radio is immediate and free. And in this city, I often meet people on this campus who know me and my voice because they listen to me with their parents. So it's the, one of the last instances of this sort of idea of storytelling, passing on knowledge, as I showed at the very beginning, from generation to generation. In this case, it's talking about reggae music. So once again, that human element. Stories define us, shape us, control us, make us happy. Okay? So COM 5580 is my way to try and um, get involved in taking my um, hobby and applying it in my work profession. So COM 5580, and this is, this is my logo, Smile Jamaica. So public relations and nonprofit campaigns. The idea is a ser service learning experience to teach COM students public relations for nonprofits. KUER is a nonprofit. KRCL is a nonprofit. So the goals of the class are to identify the four stages of the PR process. So that's the pedagogical part. That's the first two thirds of the class. And then the second part of the class is when they work for me. Now, this isn't the only time I've worked with COM 5580. This is, I've actually done four sessions of this where I'm involved in the last month of the class. So I've done it for KBR Music. I've done it for their program, Books and Beats. There was a Mark Miller event that was a sustainability nonprofit thing. And now Smile Jamaica is what they're, they're going to do, and we did that this summer. So what they're doing, it's they're producing for a client. I, in this case, am the client. So what they have to do is they have to create a strategic plan incorporating multimedia relations and outcomes, devising things that are involved in a media program like a radio program, press releases, audio and visual content, public service announcements. That's what PSA means. Web and social media. So once again, we're talking about the idea of how do you promote this stuff in, in the, the new vernacular and the new, the new media world upon which we live. So they're involved in, in with me for the last month of the class in doing that second statement, the public service announcements, the press releases, and the social media campaigns, okay? So this is Smile Jamaica. That's the reggae colors. Red for the blood of Africa, yellow for the gold of Africa, green for the bounty of Africa. 
Okay, so what is my role in this? First of all, there's the Invisible College. So this is Tristan Tavish. She teaches the class. She's the content director at KUER, and she's one of my oldest and best friends here in Salt Lake City. She used to do the show before me on KRCL before she got too busy and, and had to give it up. So the first thing that, if you're going to be doing a marketing campaign of any sort, is you need to get to know the client. So in this case, I am the client. And so what I did was I gave a class lecture on reggae music. So what is reggae music? So the demographics of this class, it was a summer class, there were only about eight or nine people in the class. Only half of them were American born. We had students from Peru, Korea, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. So I didn't assume that anybody knew anything about reggae music. So my outcomes are in parentheses there, like my role in this. So first off, class lecture, I do things on the radio called reggae history lessons, short snippets of the music I'm playing, usually a 30 second to a minute long story, and then I'll play the song. That's how I'm trying to incorporate that human element into uh, mass media consumption. So if you, if you understand anything about reggae music, you know, everybody knows Bob Marley. Most of you in this room probably have legend on your shelf. How many here have, leg have a copy of legend somewhere? Yeah, about two thirds, okay. Um, the other main thing about reggae music is, um, you know, anybody here seen The Harder They Come? The movie, the Jamaican Western with Jimmy Cliff? So in 1973, the first Whalers album, Bob Marley and the Whalers with his brethren, Peter Tosh and Bunny Whaler, that was the big thing that lit the candle in America and England for reggae music. And that movie, The Harder They Come, it played over and over again on college campuses. And people really got to love that sort of a shuffle groove of reggae music, which was much different than, than anything they had heard before. Other things that, you, that people know, the counterculture, marijuana is a big part of it, and the, the kind of ritual consumption of what Jamaicans and Rastas call ganja. So that influences a lot of the music. And this idea of the, a black Jesus, a sort of replacement for a white Jesus, and I'm going to tell you why that's important, and that is in the figure of Haile Selassie. So if you ever hear Ja Rastafari, he's the Ja. Ja is a sort of derivative of, of Yahweh, Jehovah. Rastafari is an Amharic word, which is the Ethiopian language. Haile Selassie was the emperor of Ethiopia who the Rastas saw as the reincarnation of Christ coming back to take Africans back home from the New World. So there's all of that element in there, but I'm telling them this, and in my mind, the main thing that that inspires and motivates Smile Jamaica in the music that I play is this idea of the middle passage. What happens when you're ripped out of your homeland in Africa, taken to the new world, your entire culture is destroyed, and the new culture is imposed, and you have to go through the horrors of, of slavery, and what that does to the legacy of the people who have come since for over 400 years, and oftentimes in reggae, that 400 years motif plays itself out. So why don't I see if I can play this clip, and we'll hear, and, and also, this is what my blog looks like. I have a blog for Smile Jamaica, it's smilejamaicakrcl.com, and so what I do is I list my shows there, I have my playlists and all that, and I like to put photos and captions. So let's hear, me talk on the radio, a reggae history lesson about the Middle Passage. Third World singing about the Middle Passage. Talked about that this week with Tristan's class. The Middle Passage, so what that was is ships from Europe, primarily places like Portugal, Spain, Britain, and France, Netherlands as well, would go to West Africa, pick up slaves, pack them like sardines in a tin, about half of the slaves wouldn't make the journey. Sometimes the, the boat was too full and they would just pick people up, throw them off, and that's the human marketplace by Third World. From there, the slaves were taken to the New World, primarily in, in the Jamaican case, to plant and harvest sugarcane, and the sugarcane was then taken back in those same ships to Europe. 
and that's where people could add sugar to their tea and work the assembly lines that give us the industrial revolution. So goods, rifles, textiles, commercial goods would then fill those ships for trading more slaves back to West Africa, known as the Middle Passage. Little history lesson there for you. Pretty brutal, brutal, brutal experience. So this is what one of the ships looks like. These people were packed head to toe, sent from several thousand miles across the sea. Whoever survived was then taken to, to the, um, to the um, human marketplace and sold. So imagine that I'm in front of a class and telling this story while I'm showing this web page. This is the Atlantic slave trade in two minutes. So I'm showing this. So this is 315 years of slave trades. This is a, this is a multi-modal um, map here. And so it's going to pick up. And so, and so when I'm telling the story about, this is ha about half of the music I play is about the, the uh, um, repercussions of this experience. So I remember asking when I was a kid, my parents, we would go to California to see my, par my grandparents. And I noticed one time that um, we were at a truck stop and there were a whole bunch of crates of oranges sitting on the side of the road or sitting near, near the truck stop. And I asked my dad, how come all those oranges are just sitting there? He said, well, the trucks are too full and they have to um, offload some weight. And so that's what I'm telling with that Middle Passage story. Anybody here remember the movie um, Amistad, the Steven Spielberg movie? There's a horrible scene where they take some people from down below, tie rocks to their feet, and then just literally toss them overboard like garbage. And so you imagine what that does. Now look how these are picking up going to Brazil, going to the Caribbean, going to the United States. And in, in about uh, um, the, the late 1700s, this is almost makes you dizzy. So these are all shiploads of people being ripped from their home, having a new culture imposed upon them. And that experience holds its legacy for everything that has come since in reggae music. And so if you're talking about the idea of, of telling a story, reggae musicians tell this story as a way to um, encounter social justice, um, all of those sorts of things that make reggae so popular to people like myself. And there's a pretty big subculture of reggae fans throughout the world. And so most of the, I don't play much in the way of love songs. I don't play play much in the way of, you know, kind of a novelty music. This is about half of what I'll play every week. And this idea of telling a story through somebody else's experience and how, how those lyrics can be so upliftful. So we'll go back. And so now, once they got to know kind of what was going on, then I would um, continue to instruct them on what they needed to do. So. This is my blog, Reggae History Lesson. is digital storytelling in action, communication. It's a communication class. So one of the assignments was, well, you have to listen to this program, right? So if you're writing a marketing campaign for Cheerios, you better, you better have a bowl every morning. <laughs> and so what this is, is this is my, this is my archive. So I've, you know, I've been doing this for 28 years, so I've got dozens of boxes of of Old Smile Jamaica episodes on cassettes. I've got them on CD-ROMs. I've got them on flash drives. Well, now, thanks to social media, you can park everything in one spot. And this is a site called Mixcloud, which is generally for people like me, um, DJs and club mixers who want to get other people to use their shows. So this is a Bob Marley show that, that I did. You can see, because Star Wars came out this year, I found an image with Yoda on his shoulder there. These are the numbers of people who have listened to my show. So you can see here over time, when I first started doing this about three years ago, I had about 20, 25 people a week. So now I'm getting over 100. I'm even making the charts in their, in their, in their charts. So for me, it's been a great way to expand out Smile Jamaica beyond people who listen live every Saturday at 4 o'clock. So if the, if the students couldn't listen live at 4 o'clock because maybe they're at work or something, now they have an archive where they can go. And this is my archive because the idea in, in promoting music marketing is that 
you want people to subscribe to your feed. So, I, so for example, um, I put a new show up this morning, and it's already got 21 listeners. So these are all people that get a message saying, oh, you, oh there's a new Smile Jamaica archive up, so I'm going to listen to it, and then um, other people will then favorite it, which gets it kicked into a higher gear. They'll repost it so their followers find it. And for me, it's truly the viral in viral media. And it's really been a huge, huge way for me to grow my show and stay, um, stay uh, relevant in a new media. Remember, I'm old media. So radio is traditional media. But how do you promote that traditional media in, in a um, social media, new media environment? So these are the things I teach when I'm doing these classes, okay? So they had to listen to the show. I gave a tour of the station. There was a videographer involved, so they got to film me in action. And this is like more broadcast media, traditional media, marketing promotion. I teach students how to write public service announcements. Those are the 30 to 60 second spots that, that you hear on radio when other people aren't, um, when, when you're not playing the music. Usually they either play advertising, or in our case it's called underwriting, or um, you know, announcing shows, thing, things like that. So these are, these are the sorts of things that, that you'll hear, and I'm going to play an example of one. So I teach them how to write that, because you have to be able to write and be effective in 30-second increments. Really, it's 20-second increments. So your, spots can't be, your radio spots can't be longer than 30 seconds, and I teach to do a lead-in, with music and a lead out with music. And the reason is, is I don't want people to think if I play one of these spots that I'm going to a commercial break. So you want to kind of try, you want to try and trick your audience into thinking that you're getting another song and hope that it's short enough that they won't hit the button. Because that's what we're always struggling with is people always, people are more fickle now than they've ever been when it comes to interruptions in their media. So I, iTunes, nobody's breaking in on your iTunes to, to sell you something. Okay, but we have to in radio because that's how we pay the bills. So once they've written their PSAs and working with me, then they come into the audio studio, which is in the faculty center, and then they record them. And so this, this student is Fahad from Kuwait. And so one of the assignments was is he had to incorporate my taglines. Taglines are like how you, you know, repeat, you know, repeat yourself and all that so people kind of know. So I always start off saying greetings. That's my, that's my thing. Every show I start off with that. Roots Reggae and Dove for 25 plus years. That's how long I've been doing it. Reggae history lessons. That's one of the things that I do that makes Smile Jamaica a little different than, than your Spotify or Pandora stream. And then my two slogans, your college for musical knowledge and the king's music, in this case the king being Haile Selassie, Jamaican blues. So let's hear 30 seconds of this. Greetings, Earthling. Robert Nilsson, who has been the host of the Smile Jamaica, telling listeners about reggae history for more than a quarter of a century. Your college for musical knowledge, roots reggae and dub, the King's music, and Jamaican blues on Saturdays from 4 to 7 p.m. on 90.9 FM KRCL. That's why I put sound art on one of the outcomes. Because once they did all this, then because, because he was an Arabic speaker, I wanted to put in something that sounded similar to where he's from, although that, that might be more South, South uh, Asia than, than the, the Middle East. But, he, but, um, but he, he picked up on all that, and, and it's like he didn't really know much about reggae. But because of my working with him, that, that's what we had as our outcome. So the other thing that I did was we had to do some uh, um, we had to do some bumpers. Bumpers are your station identification information, and usually whenever I get somebody in the studio with me, especially if they're a foreign language speaker, I'll ask them quickly if they can record just one sentence. 90.9 FM, Smile Jamaica. So here's here's uh, one of the Spanish students who recorded one for me. 90.9 FM, Jamaica, Sonríe. So I'll play these in between songs because you have to do station identification. So I figure why not do something that's, you know, kind of like, 
like a foreign language thing as opposed to the, to the usual like 90.9 FMs in English. And I, and I have a lot of those as well. Okay, so I did um, on KRCL until they, until they closed down the show in 2012, I also did interviews for them, political interviews, radioactive. Had anybody ever heard those before? So radioactive was like kind of kind of anybody who listens to Doug Fabrizio knows that was kind of our version, a little little left, little to the far left of where, where he's coming from in a lot of ways. So I got to interview people like Howard Zinn and uh, Naomi Klein, Amy Goodman, Ralph Nader, um, Roger Altizer. One of my favorite interviews was with Roger. He's coming up next, talking about video game addiction, where some of these players are so addicted they'd rather wear a diaper than stop playing. And so Roger brought in the context, and then we had a, a video game here. <laughs> and so, so it's really good to have all that. And so when, once you, there's a way to do interviewing for research that is what I teach as well. And the idea is, is how you ask your questions in an interview is how you get your good research. So you got to do it like who, what, when, where, why, and how. And then they can't answer just yes or no, it takes your bias out of it. So I, I show people how to do that as well. And there was an interview portion as well. So those were the things I did. Now quickly what I want to do is run down their, the student outcomes for this. And so the first one was they, they were required for six total 30 second audio promos that we recorded. So I had, it, it was great because I had an, a native speaker of Arabic and a native speaker of Korean. So it was really great working with them to get them confidence and being able to write because a lot of foreign students, they really feel self-conscious about their, their writing skills or their speaking skills too. And so I, I was able to work with them to get them over that sort of self-consciousness and then we uh, worked together to do the six spots. Okay, they also had to do a promotional video. So it was a one minute long video. So that's, that's me twiddling the dials down at KRCL. So that's what, a, that's what a radio board looks like. Has anybody here been to a radio station to see anything go on? So yeah, so that's, so that's what I'm doing. So all of those things are how the signal goes out onto the air. Blog posts were a part of this as well. So the outcomes there are social media, writing for the web, visual communication, I made them look at my blog to get ideas on the sorts of things to write about. They also had to create logos, which is, you know, graphic design, marketing, promotion, visual communication. So these are the logos they came up with using, you know, some permutation of the red, green, and gold, because those are the, those are the main colors of, uh, of reggae music. They also had to design print ads. So these are the print ads. So a little mock-up on the left, and then there's the ad on the right. The interview, unfortunately, that we did, the young woman, she literally went from interviewing me in the faculty center, got in her car, and got to St. George, and, and she was in a car accident. So unfortunately, the, that didn't happen. But, she, but, it, but I showed her my, my libguide. The, the interview was great, and, and, and it was just one of those horrible circumstances of you know, of, of that we didn't get to include that in here. And then the other thing is the social media campaign because as Tony said, routine, traditional media is only half the story anymore. So we've got to reach these people where they're at. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all those sorts of things, Tumblr accounts. And so that is what I did to incorporate outcomes using new media, Digital, t digital storytelling into pedagogy. And we're probably over time, but I'd be glad to take any questions if anybody has them for me. Okay. Well, thank you very much for, for attending our presentation.